Welcome to Lesson 6b, Linear Momentum Fixed Control Volume. In this lesson, we'll derive the linear momentum equation for a control volume. We'll talk only about a fixed control volume. We'll define a correction factor, look at the various forces that act on the control volume, and do some examples. First, the derivation. We start with the Reynolds transport theorem for a fixed control volume. For a system, we write dt of mv of the system equals sigma f acting on the system, where mv is the linear momentum of the system, and sigma f represents all the forces acting on the system. As an aside, differentiate by parts, we get these two terms. But this one's identically zero, since the mass of a system cannot change by definition. So m dv dt equal f is our familiar Newton's second law, since this is acceleration. So this is really another way of writing Newton's second law. In the Reynolds transport theorem, we'll let capital B be m v, the linear momentum. And so little b is b over m is just v, the velocity. So our RTT becomes d dt of mv system equals sigma f equal d dt of the control volume integral of rho v dv plus integral over the control surface rho v v dot nda. Similar to what we've done before, this left part is the system part, and this right part is the control volume part. Sigma f is the same in both of these, since we're talking about the same volume at a particular time, either the system or the control volume. So this is our control volume equation. I typed it up here along with an explanation of the terms. This is the total force vector acting on the control volume. This term is the rate of change of linear momentum inside the control volume. And this is the net rate of linear momentum flow out of the control volume. Unlike what we had for mass and energy, this is a vector equation. As we'll see in practice, we usually split this up into components. Now let's simplify for well-defined inlets and outlets to avoid having to integrate all the time. Since in most of our problems we have something like this with well-defined inlets and outlets, we put a control volume slicing through all of those, and we have some force that we're trying to calculate typically. So I repeated the equation from above, and let's consider the control surface integral. This density times v dot nda at a given inlet or outlet becomes m dot at an inlet or outlet. There's also a vector velocity here. That's the average velocity at an inlet or outlet. But we typically drop the AVG subscript for convenience. So our equation becomes this, where we've replaced the control surface integral by these terms. As we've mentioned several times, the signs take care of themselves term is positive for outflows and negative for inflows, so we put the negative sign here. Well, just as we did with the energy equation, we need to define a correction factor for the same reason, namely these terms are approximations due to nonlinearity of the integral. For example, at an outlet, the actual velocity profile may look something like this, where v is the average and this is the cross-sectional area at the outlet. In this term, we've approximated the velocity profile as uniform. But when you do the integration, this is not exact. In fact, it turns out that rho integral over ac v squared dA is greater than rho v squared ac, where we recognize this as m dot. You may recall that we had a v cubed term in the kinetic energy equation. In this case, we have a v with another v, which is why we get a v squared here. We're also talking about incompressible flow, so I took the density out. Well, because of this, we have to define a momentum flux correction factor. We call it beta. Beta is 1 over ac, integral over ac, u over v squared dac where u is the component of v perpendicular to ac. In our case, if this is the x-axis, then this velocity component is u. So this is our momentum flux correction factor, very similar to the kinetic energy correction factor alpha, but with an exponent 2 instead of 3 here. Just as alpha was greater than or equal to 1, for any velocity profile, beta has to be greater than or equal to 1. Here are some example betas. The simplest case is uniform flow, which gives beta equal 1, since u is everywhere equal to v, as shown here. For fully developed laminar pipe flow, we have a parabolic velocity profile with average v and speed u that's not uniform. If you do the math with this equation, beta comes out to be 4 thirds. For fully developed turbulent pipe flow, the velocity profile looks something like that, and depending on the Reynolds number, beta ranges from about 1.01 .01 to 1.04. We'll let beta equal 1.02 for fully developed turbulent pipe flow unless otherwise specified. When we include beta, we simply put it in as a correction factor in these inlet and 
outlet terms. This is a more useful version of the momentum equation, but we're not quite ready for examples yet because we haven't dealt with the force term yet. Let's look at all the forces acting on a control volume. This term represents the sum of all the forces acting on the control volume. We'll split them up as follows, body forces plus surface forces. In this course, we consider only the gravity force, but you can have electromagnetic forces and other such things. The surface forces include all the forces acting on the control volume. These would include pressure forces that are everywhere normal, viscous forces that are everywhere tangential, and other forces such as if you're cutting through a cable or you're slicing through a bolt that's holding the control volume in place. We'll just group these as other forces. So we split the surface forces into pressure, viscous, and other forces. So we'll expand the force term to be sigma f gravity plus sigma f pressure plus sigma f viscous plus sigma f other. F gravity is just the weight of the control volume, including the fluid and anything else in the control volume like pipe walls, etc. if your control volume is outside of the pipe. This viscous term can be difficult. Fortunately, it's usually zero by Y's choice of control volume. So finally, the most useful form of the linear momentum equation is given here. We have the four forces, the unsteady part, and then the inlets and outlets. Most of our problems will be steady, so this term can also be ignored. This is our workhorse equation for control volume momentum problems. And it's valid for situations like this, where there are some inlets and outlets and some forces acting. Now we're ready for some example problems. I'll do a few here and there are many more in the book. Let's consider steady laminar incompressible axisymmetric flow from a well-rounded inlet into a pipe. The velocity is nearly uniform there, but it's fully developed here. And this sketch is not to scale. It typically takes many diameters to achieve this fully developed condition. The parabolic velocity profile when fully developed is given by this equation. And let's suppose that P2 is measured. P1 is also measured. And we want to calculate the total friction force acting on the fluid by the pipe wall from 1 to 2. The first step in any of these problems is to choose a wise control volume. I cannot overemphasize this point. As we saw with the energy equation, a wise choice of control volume can save us a lot of headache and work. In this case, I'm going to go along the inside of the pipe wall. Since we're interested in the total friction force on the pipe wall, I slice through the inlet and the outlet and complete my control volume. Now we'll use our conservation equations. Conservation of mass, m dot in equal m dot out, or rho u1 a1 equal rho u2 average a2. It's incompressible, so the densities go away and area 1 equal area 2, so u2 average must equal u1. If we had an arbitrary velocity profile, we would have to integrate to find the momentum flux correction factors, but here we have a uniform flow at 1, so beta 1 equal 1, and we have fully developed laminar pipe flow at 2, for which beta 2 is 4 thirds. If you plug in this equation and do the integration, you should get 4 thirds. Now let's use this approximate most useful form of the linear momentum equation, which I called the workhorse equation. This problem is in the x direction. Gravity is into the page, so the gravity term is 0. This is a steady problem, so that term goes away. We're not slicing through any cables or struts or anything with our choice of control volume, so there's no F other term. Note that if we would have taken this control volume outside of the pipe, we would be cutting through the pipe wall, and there would be a force required to hold that wall in place. In that case, we would have to keep the F other term in. We do have pressure forces and viscous forces, and we have these two terms to deal with. I should have mentioned that we are considering only the x component of this equation. Now let's look at the pressure and viscous forces acting on our control volume. I resketched just the control volume. There's a viscous force acting on our control volume, which is our fluid, by the wall. This viscous force acts around the circumference of the pipe. There's also a pressure force acting at the inlet. This acts at the cross-sectional area of the pipe, A1. Similarly, we have P2A2 at the outlet. I sketched these as constant pressures, but if this pressure distribution were not uniform, P2 would be the average pressure here, and P1 the average pressure here. So the x component of our momentum equation becomes sigma fx equals sigma fx gravity plus sigma fx pressure plus sigma fx viscous plus sigma fx other equals sigma out beta m dot u average minus sigma in beta m dot u average. We've already said that there's no gravity in the x direction. We're not slicing through any kind of cables. This term is negative 
F. viscous, you must be careful of signs. The pipe wall is exerting a force in the negative x direction on the fluid. Since the fluid is our control volume and these are forces acting on the control volume, this term must be negative F viscous. This term is P1A1 minus P2A2, again being concerned with the signs. Pressure is acting in the positive direction here and in the negative direction here. In our problem, there's only one outlet and one inlet. At the outlet, this is beta 2, and at the inlet, this is beta 1. And m dot is rho u average a, which is equal to rho u average pi r squared, since this is a round pipe of radius r. We rewrite this equation then. Solving for the unknown, we have F viscous as P1 minus P2A plus beta 1 m dot U1, where U average is U1, as we said previously, minus beta 2 m dot U1. Again, being careful of our signs from this equation. We had stated already that beta 1 was 1, and beta 2 was 4 thirds, and A is pi r squared. So the viscous or friction force becomes pi r squared, P1 minus P2 minus 1 third rho u1 squared, where we plug this in for m dot and simplified. This is our answer in variable form. I'm not going to put in any numbers for this problem to save time. Let's look at another example, tension in a cable. A cart with frictionless wheels and a tank of water shoots water at a deflector plate. It shoots out at some angle, theta, and this jet has a speed, an area, and a beta. There's a cable holding this cart in place attached to a wall. We'll ignore friction in the wheels. Hopefully you can see that this jet is acting like a rocket exhaust that's trying to push the cart to the left, but the cable is holding it in place. We want to calculate the tension in the cable. As always, the first step is to choose a wise control volume. Well, obviously I want to cut through the jet. I'll go underneath my frictionless wheels, around the tank, and as we've done before, I'll pick a control volume just under the surface of the water, where this will be our inlet and the jet will be our outlet. The second step is to use the approximate workhorse form of the linear momentum equation, which I've rewritten here. And as we typically will do, we'll split this into components. Here we write the x component, which is all we care about because the cable is in the x direction. If this cable were at some angle, we would have to calculate both an x and a z component of the tension. So let's analyze this. Again, there's no gravity in the x direction. The pressure here is atmospheric. In fact, the pressure everywhere is atmospheric. And so the pressure term goes away. I'll put my reason underneath. P equal P atmosphere everywhere. So all the pressure terms cancel out. What about the viscous forces? Well, there certainly are viscous forces along this plate, but those are inside our control volume. When we're analyzing control volume problems, we really don't care what's inside the control volume. Since our surface does not slice through this plate, the viscous terms are zero. My reason is that we chose a wise control volume. If our control volume would have gone along the plate, we would have a much more difficult time. The only other force is the tension T in the cable, which we must include since we're slicing the control volume through that cable. It's acting in the positive x direction. U is the x component of the velocity vector, and at our inlet 1, U1 is 0, so this term goes away. Now we have to consider this term. We have V jet as the magnitude, but we're interested only in the U component. Since this angle is theta, U is equal to V jet cosine theta. Putting all these terms together and solving for T, the tension, T equal beta of the jet, m dot, which is rho V jet A jet, and then U, which we just said was V jet cosine theta. So our final answer is shown here. This is our final result in variable form. If I had given numerical values, you could just plug those in at this point. I'll do one final example. The force imparted by a water jet striking a vertical plate. Again, the jet has speed vj, area aj, and momentum flux correction factor beta j. The nozzle is in the x direction. Here we do give some numbers, and we want to calculate the force required to keep this plate stationary. The jet will try to push this plate to the right, so we need a force to hold it there. As you should know by now, the first step is always to choose a wise control volume. I'll choose my control volume along the outside of the plate so that the force is acting on it. I cut through the jets at both inlets and outlets, and that's a wise choice of control volume. I didn't say whether this plate is circular or rectangular. It turns out that it doesn't matter. The jet splatters against the plate and then shoots the water out in various directions pretty much radially symmetric around the axis of the jet. We can call this speed V out, the area A out. 
and there'll be some beta out. I'm drawing it here, but it includes the entire circumference of the outlets. Now let's use our workhorse equation again. We're talking again about just the x component. It's steady state, so we don't have the unsteady term. And I like to first cross off the terms that are zero, and then deal with the rest. There's no gravity in the x direction. P equal P atmosphere everywhere. My wise choice of control volume pressure acting on the left is the same as the pressure acting on the right, so the pressure forces cancel everywhere. Similar to the previous problem, there are viscous forces along the plate, but they're inside our control volume, so this term goes away by Y's choice of control volume. The only other force is F, and it's in the negative direction, acting on our control volume. The X component of the velocity at the outlet is zero everywhere, so this term goes away. We have only one inlet, our beta is beta jet, our mass flow rate is rho vj aj, and then u is vj. So the only two remaining terms are this term, negative f, equal, and there's a negative sign here. So my final result for f is beta j rho vj squared aj, which is our answer in variables. The problem asks us to compare the impact of beta. So I'm going to do three cases. If beta jet is 1, in other words, we consider this to be a uniform jet, then we get f equal 1 times rho times vj squared times aj and two unity conversion factors to get our answer in newtons. I get 15.3 newtons. If fully developed laminar flow from this round pipe at the nozzle, beta here would be 4 thirds, repeating the calculations with the only difference being a different beta. We get 20.0 newtons. And let me correct this. This turns out to be 15.0 newtons for beta equal 1. Finally, if fully developed turbulent flow, we'll use beta equal 1.02, and we get 15.3 newtons. If we had ignored beta, we get 15.0. So for turbulent flow, it's not that big of a difference. But beta is very critical for problems with laminar flows. But I advise you to always include beta in any of these kind of momentum problems. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.